Okay, good afternoon to all of you. My name is Tom Flint. I'm the director of the Center for Philosophy of Religion. And on behalf of the center, I'd like to welcome all of you to this, the fifth annual Planting a Fellow lecture. Uh, the Planting a Fellow this year is Yehuda Gelman, who's a professor at Ben Gurion University in Israel. Professor Gelman received his PhD from Wayne State University, where one of his teachers, oddly enough, was the uh, the original Al Plantinga, namely the Al Plantinga who's sitting over there, that planting a fellow, not this planting a fellow. Um, Professor Gelman's taught at Ben Gurion since 1971 and uh, survived not just one but two terms as chair of the department there. Um, he's the author of four books and over 100 articles on a wide variety of topics in philosophical theology in uh, Jewish philosophy. Uh, he's written on major figures such as Kierkegaard and Maimonides and on lots of other topics in philosophy as well. Uh, it's been a real delight to have Yehuda with us at the center this year, and it's an honor for me to present him to you. His uh, topic today is The Sacrifice of Isaac, a Comedy in Two Acts. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Gelman. Thank you very much. I see that my reputation has gone before me. <laughs> um, I like an intimate group. Thank you very much. Uh, and I want to thank the people of the center for having me this year. And uh, it is a great privilege to have a fellowship in the name of my old teacher, or my young old teacher, Alvin Plantinga, I was, with, I was in his seminar when he was doing God and Other Minds, uh, which was a landmark, and I'm in, greatly indebted to him for my philosophical training. I'm talking today about the sacrifice, you can hear me okay? okay? The Sacrifice of Isaac, a Comedy in Two Acts. Uh, you should have a handout there, which is something I'm going to be having here on the screen, but we'll be referring to it throughout, so it's a good idea for you to have it in your hands as well. Please don't read it now. <laughs> Through the ages, Jewish and Christian commentators have given widely disparate interpretations of some of the same biblical events. The disparity is clearly manifest in the story of the sacrifice of Isaac. Indeed, Jews and Christians do not even give the same name to the episode in Genesis. The Christian name, the sacrifice of Isaac, reflects Christian prefiguration theology, according to which the episode is an aborted figure of God's sacrifice of his own beloved son. I think it's in John. Am I right, Alan? John, right. The Jewish name, the binding of Isaac, or the Akedah, aims to deflect the supersessionist theology implied in prefiguration and prompts a Jewish atonement theology based entirely on Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son. Today I want to present a Jewish interpretation of the Abraham story that is probably as far from Christian understanding as one can possibly get and is idiosyncratic in Judaism as well. This is an interpretation I extract from the thought of the Hasidic master, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, known as Reb Nachman, who lived in the Ukraine from 1772 to 1810, and was a great-grandson of the founder of the Hasidic movement, Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov. Reb Nachman is known for his unusual teachings, and this one, presents the near sacrifice of Isaac as a comedy in two acts. The subtitle of my talk could well be Hegel and the Hasidim, for the comic interpretation of the Akedah and Reb Nachman is best understood in light of what Hegel wrote about Judaism. In his early essay, The Spirit of Christianity and Its Fate, and also in his lectures on philosophy and religion, particularly in the manuscript of 1821. Now, while Hegel somewhat modified his view of Judaism in later writings, these texts 
are most pertinent, I think, to my presentation. I will show how Reb Nachman stands Hegel on his head in a comedy in two acts. Not that Reb Nachman had any idea of Hegel's existence. I begin with Hegel. In his earlier writings, Hegel discredited Judaism for believing in what Hegel defines in his Science of Logic as a bad or spurious infinity, namely an infinity, quote, posited over against the finite, unquote. This is in contrast to an infinity that finitizes itself, that self-differentiates to make manifest a world that is included in itself. Thus, the key to understanding Judaism in its teaching of cre is its teaching from creation from nothing by a holy other God who stands altogether above and has power over the natural order. This is why Hegel calls Judaism a religion of sublimity. The Jew is alienated from such a God, and because the Jew's true essence is included in the divine, the Jew is also alienated from his or her own true essence. The defining concept of Judaism is dependence upon God, and its operational principle is command, externally imposed by a powerful master upon the servant who must obey. The Jew, in obeying the commandments, shapes a relationship of fear with God from whom he or she is alienated. For Hegel, alas, no amount of obedience to the divine master or compensatory self-affirmation as a chosen people can succeed in overcoming the essential ontological divide Judaism posits between creator and creature. The unfortunate Jews believe in a, quote, an infinite power set over against themselves that they could never conquer, unquote. The result is a persistent pain and unhappiness at the very heart of Jewish religious practice, a pain of frustration and alienation. But the obstinate Jews refuse to acknowledge the true source of this estrangement, and Judaism survives, according to Hegel, only by self-deceptively blaming the absence of reconciliation on the people's sinfulness. Now, Hegel came to see, not in these earlier writings, but somewhat later, to see Christianity in the following terms. A God who, in Hegel's words, validates the moment of infinitude within itself is a good or genuine infinity. Hegel came to see Christianity as a breakthrough to such a God by its presenting in a pictorial way what Hegel's philosophy of the genuine infinite presents in a conceptual way. Christianity is the consummate religion because it teaches that the infinite enters into human finitude and suffers death, the ultimate mark of finitude. This encompassing of the finite by the infinite is then sealed with the resurrection, signifying for Hegel the presence of the divine within the community. Thus does Christianity portray the genuine infinite achieving self-consciousness within the finite. And this recognition constitutes true reconciliation between the person and God. Now, Jewish philosophers, including Nachman Krachmar in the 19th century and Emil Fackenheim in the 20th century, have criticized Hegel's negative judgment about Judaism. I, quite naturally, agree with them. On the other hand, Hegel can help us understand a central theme in early Hasidism and through that understand Reb Nachman of Breslov. Early Hasidim were spiritually troubled. We're talking here in the second half of the 18th century, early 19th century. Early Hasidim were spiritually troubled by what they perceived as the limitations inherent 
in the commandment mode of divine service. They experienced the commandments as an intervening intrusion between them and God, just as much as a way to God. For example, the 18th century Hasidic master, Yaakov Joseph of Polnoy, defined the commandments as God's messengers and expressed his desire to know God directly and not merely through God's messengers. For the Hasidim, a person is, quote, a part of God from above, unquote. So for them to know God directly meant overcoming their sense of creaturely separateness to achieve union with God. This nullification of separateness was realized in prayer, and its effects could linger outside of prayer in one's daily life. So here we have an explicit acknowledgement in Judaism of a Hegelian unhappiness from a keen sense of alienation from God, inherent in the commandment mode of Judaism. While these Hasidic masters scrupulously fulfilled the commandments, they saw their obedience as a prelude to achieving union with God in prayer, and to be pursued thereafter. In this union, the opposition between the finite and infinite disappears. For the Hasidim, therefore, the resolution of the Hegelian pain of Judaism consisted precisely in coming to know a God who, quote, finitizes, unquote, a God containing the finite within its own being. Now, Rav Nachman pushed this Hasidic dissatisfaction to its limits. Here is what he said, and this is going to be crucial to later comedy. I do not know who can say that he serves God because of God's greatness. Someone who knows even a little of his greatness, I don't know how he can say that he serves God. However, the important thing is the will, that one's will be strong and unrelenting, always to come close to God. The main thing is the will and yearning that he should always yearn for him. And in this way, we to pray, study, and perform the commandments. And in truth, according to his greatness, all of these services are nothing. But everything is as though, now my emphasis, for it is all just a joke compared to his greatness. 